All right, so um, let's hear the word of God. Uh, today's scripture lesson comes from Romans 8, 1 through 11. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own son in the likeliness, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin. He condemned, condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit. Since the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, through the body, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. So today, um, we are starting a new kind of series. So we're going to spend the next three weeks talking about the first couple of um, the first couple of verses in Romans 8. Um, so today we're going to talk about keeping your mind kind of focused um, on things that are of Christ. Uh, next week we'll discuss how we as debtors, and in this, uh, we are debtors, and how this debt makes us not alone. And finally on the 26th, we'll focus on prayer in our lives and how prayer transforms and how prayer equips and enables and overcomes and conquers. But being separated is something that we're all too familiar with, right, with this COVID-19 uh, world that we're living in. We aren't allowed within six feet of each other. When we go to the grocery store, we have to you know, awkwardly bend around those plexiglass shields right, to get our money to the cashier to put our items on the counter. We might not have been able to see our families because we didn't want to get anyone sick. We haven't been able to visit the shut-ins because of the risk of spreading disease. We right now are a physically distanced society. We're slowly growing away from people. We're longing for those physical interactions, longing for closeness, longing for connections. Right, in my case, longing for an open buffet. But that's a whole other side note issue. Um, just be amazing. Just Anyway. Um, however, right, in the past few weeks, we are seeing some of these restrictions lifted. Right? And it's been glorious. We've been able to go out to some places and things. But it's not without consequence. Right? We're seeing this uptick in cases. Counties going back to limiting indoor activities. Right? Back to longing for connections. Although we may not be able to have these close interactions with people around us, we can have, and always are able to have, a non-socially distant relationship with Jesus Christ. Right? If we just let go of ourselves, and if we live in him. I think to fully understand today's scripture in Romans 8, we kind of have to back up a few verses to see what question Paul is attempting to answer. Right? He ends chapter 7 with what sounds like a personal outburst um, of his own sinfulness. So he says... For I do not do good that I want, do not do the good that I want, 
but the evil that I do not want is what I do. Right? That's Romans 7.19. This final passage from chapter 7 is one that redeems the person of Paul in many people's eyes. But to be brutally honest, to admit his own failings, to confess his own wrestling with sin in his own body and life makes him more human, makes him more like us, and we can sympathize. More than that, we can feel a little bit, or maybe even a lot, better about our own failures and inadequacies. If even Paul can struggle, we think that maybe our struggles aren't so bad. Except, I don't know that that's necessarily why Paul ended chapter 7 that way. Um, he wasn't going for solidarity solidarity with us poor sinners. Um, he might not have even been talking about himself in this case. Most of the letter the Roman, the, to the Romans was written in a dialogue style, right, where Paul takes on a kind of dual persona, where he debates and argues with himself to present his ideas. So this might have been a technique that he was using to wrap up this first section and then to introduce the second section of this letter. However, Paul wasn't averse to using his own life to make his point. Right? He was well aware of his own shortcomings. So why not allow this moment of personal privilege or personal shame to set up what he intends to say? Philip Brooks famously said that preaching is bringing truth through personality. So here, Paul is bringing this truth through the personality of his own life. Except that it isn't about Paul. Or rather, it is about Paul, but not only Paul. It's about Paul as a representative of all of us. It's about the human condition, the human condition of ultimate helplessness. It's to bring about our own salvation, or in Paul's words, to rescue us from the body of death. The body of death that we will focus on today is the loss of convictionalism, or being without someone or something which is the case, which in this case is true of which is the case of a true relationship with Christ. So, how do we do that? And how do we not lose our connectionalism? First off, we need to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. There we go. It's up there. Okay. So, Paul does not mince his words here on this topic, right? We are to walk with the spirit not with the flesh. Every single day, we're faced with temptations of the flesh. Because we are a fallen man, it's not easy to resist these temptations. We have a perpetuation to sin and to give in to these temptations. We don't have to work to sin. We have to work to overcome these temptations. The lusts of the flesh aren't just limited to what we see as the body, as of the body or fleshly sins. Right, it's things like sexual deviation, body mutilation, any of those things. What Paul is referring to here is just more than that. It's more than that. He's talking about things like idolatry. Right? He's talking about gossip. He's talking about dishonoring our parents, coveting things of others. Right? The list can go on and on and on and on. But you see, this world is a broken and sinful world that sucks us in and doesn't release its grips easily. Everywhere we look, there's temptation from the principalities of darkness that are fighting for our soul. We can't even turn on the TV without seeing the corruption of this world. The headlines say it all. We see things like, how many people have been shot today? Right? How many have been put in jail because they did something wrong? How many people are hurt because of the choices that others have made? We're being torn apart limb by limb by these evil forces. The things of the flesh tear us apart. They don't bring us together. We hate because someone doesn't think the same as us. We hate because we look different than someone. We say mean things about people because they're different. And last week we talked about coming together as a church and using each of our own God-given ta talents and gifts to be one body of believers. The Big C Church. But the only way that we can do that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it in our own flesh. Our flesh is weak, but we are made strong through our submission to the Spirit. 
Okay, so there was this large period in my life where I wasn't connected to God in any way. Nor did I care to have a relationship with him. I was living in the flesh. I'm sure there are people here that have had that experience or that know someone who has separated themselves from God. It's a very difficult time in our lives. Not having any sense of bigger purpose. Not having clarity of design. Not having the strength of a higher power to free us from our transgressions. The power of the Spirit gives us that, as Paul tells us here. Don't be confused about the true power of the Spirit with the fake Christianity that floats around out there, especially those of those those high-profile, multi-millionaire TV preachers that tell you to live your best life ever. Those who say that when we have a relationship with Jesus, that all of a sudden everything is just rainbows and unicorns. This is not promised to us as followers of Christ. As a matter of fact, if we look at the book of Luke, Jesus tells us the exact opposite. And he tells us to his disciples, which of course translates to us today as disciples of Christ as well. Luke 9.23 says, And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We daily have to take up our own crosses and follow Jesus. The cross that means torture, the means of disgrace, the means of public humiliation, the means of oppression, the means of death. That doesn't sound like rainbows and unicorns to me. But we have Jesus to get us through the rough and the tough. I'm not sure about you, but over these past few months and dealing with this virus, I felt an even greater connection to Jesus than I ever had before. I had time to refocus on what is important in my life, my faith, my family. But as we deal with these new normals, isn't it time that we take that time to just refocus and to put our attention where it should be, on the spirit and not on the flesh? From working with youth, I know that time alone can be detrimental to mental health, especially when those when so many just long for that time of social interaction. But as adults, we're the same as well. And when we're walking in the flesh, in the flesh, however, we realize that in those times, that we're not alone. The Spirit is with us, and we are walking with Him all the time. Find those times to make sure that you're spending time with Jesus in prayer, in contemplative practices, in reading, and in learning. The second way that we need to kind of set our minds um, to prepare ourselves is to know that life comes through the Spirit, not through us. You got me. Uh, So in order to set our mind, we have to be willing to let go of ourselves and realize that life comes through the Spirit. Too often times, we put ourselves out at the forefront of our lives and not Christ. This can have dire consequences for us. God wants us to give him our most valuable possession, possession, which is ourselves. You may be taking up on something that just doesn't seem right with this last statement that I just said. The point is all this this point is all about power over or power of the spirit over the power of self. So then how can we give ourselves to Christ if all things are through his power? That's a good question. I'm glad you were thinking about that while I was up here. So I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit, okay? The the answer to that is that we can't, right? We don't make the choice to have God in our lives. See, God has already been there. That choice has been made for us. God is here. God was with us before we knew him. And God will be with us even if we fall away from him. But I hear so many times... I made the choice to have Christ in my life. This is fundamentally flawed. You make the choice to acknowledge Christ in your life. He's been there the whole time. Let me say that again. You make the choice to acknowledge Christ in your life. He's been there the whole time. If God is omnipotent and God is omnipresent, how do we in our flesh get to decide if God is with us. We don't. We don't. You see, there's this great duality 
that we need to discuss, friends. And that is the choice of how you live. You can live your life self-directed or spirit-directed. Living guided only by self, that well, that leads to death. Paul tells us, yeah. but guided by the spirit is how we know the fullness of life. Paul tells us living by the spirit takes at the outset. It takes a surrender of self. It takes an admission that you are powerless in the face of your own sin or yourself. Too often, we want to use our faith. We want to use Jesus as an add-on, as a spiritual booster. Um, right? As the Bible commentator Blair Allison Crow called it, a spiritual booster. It's right? something to get us over that hump that life throws at us. But here's the key. We're that hump. Right? We're that hump. We are the very thing that needs to be moved out of the way for the Spirit to take up residence in us so that we can be in Christ. Okay, notice it says in Christ, not Christ in us. We are subsumed in Christ. It's not our wills. It's not our wills, but Christ's will that will guide us. Our fear here is that somehow we will be less ourselves when we surrender to Christ. But in fact, the opposite is true. We become more of ourselves. This is what Paul means when he says, the Spirit will give life to our mortal bodies. We are more fully ourselves when we set our minds on things of the Spirit. When we set aside what this culture calls looking out for number one. Right? Then we become more truly alive. So, stop thinking that you can do it on your own. Rely on the power of the Spirit, right? God wants us to rely on Him. How would it change your outlook on life if you fundamentally change this one thing about the way that you talk, or how you talk? Think about this for a second. I want you to think about using the phrase, we, in place of the I, anytime you're talking about doing something. So, not... I am going to get groceries, but we are going to get groceries. Not, I am going to make dinner, but we are going to make dinner. Not, I am going on vacation, but we are going on vacation. Now, you might get some odd looks from people that you don't know, or people that haven't heard me say this, um, but, but, but that's okay. They might ask you, who else is going with you to get groceries, or to make dinner, or on vacation? But what a great opportunity to evangelize to someone, to spread the great message of Christ present in our lives. Plus, it's a constant reminder for us that truly the Spirit is with us wherever we are. It is a reminder that we are together with Christ always. So, the third way that we need to kind of get our mind set um, here is do. Right. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. I should just let you. Why, why do I even try? I just let you take it. Um, anyway, so there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. There is a reason that I say the very first words of the scripture reading for the very last one. These are the words from Paul that kind of bring this whole passage home. Think about those words. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. What a powerful phrase. Imagine a world where we are so accepted that there is no condemnation for who you are. No one cares how much money you have. No one cares what clothes you wear. No one cares what car you drive. No one cares about your body type or if you're skinny or not. No one cares if you have glasses on or not. The list can go on and on in this world without condemnation. But Paul gives us this recipe for success in these verses today. And the answer is simple. It's a very simple one. Um, and verse 11 kind of tells us that. Verse 11 says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead 
dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit that dwells in you. There it is. The spirit, the essence of Christ, in God the Father has to dwell in us. We need to be forward-thinking with Christ in our lives. We need to not limit what God can do in our lives. Don't put God in a box with confinement and with parameters. That is limiting to the glory of God. While being thankful for things that God has done for our, done for us in our lives, we need to be forward-thinking. Thinking about how what we are doing right this moment is going to affect us in our relationship with Christ tomorrow. We are doing things, are we doing things that will pull us away from Christ tomorrow or things that will draw us nearer to him? Just as God has laid the bricks of the road before us, we can come over top of that brick road and put a new blacktop surface, right, which, present, which prevents us from seeing the path that God has laid out and where that road may take us. We need to focus on that place without condemnation, that place where the brick road before us leads, the path that God has laid down, that brick road that leads us to the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so I'm still not too terribly familiar with this area, but I'm assuming that somewhere near here, there's still brick paved roads. I think up around the circle, right? Is that, is that still brick paved up there? Um, but, uh, so I want you to imagine driving over one of those brick paved roads. The road is bumpy. The road is not smooth. Right? It's not easy to drive on. But Pastor Ryan, I want to drive on a smooth road. And you're telling me that God has laid down this bumpy road and the road that I will lay down is smooth. Why wouldn't I think that one? But yes, I see that. But as we discussed from that verse from Luke earlier, the road is bumpy. We have to take up our crosses. You see, there's a place where in the distance, if you've been following the road, the place where that road just suddenly comes to a wall. The road on the other side of that wall is paved with gold. There are no bumps, no bricks, only streets of gold. This is where the place of no condemnation that Paul was talking about truly exists. This is the kingdom that we inherit when we surrender to Christ. This is the kingdom of heaven, the place where we can spend the glorious eternity without condemnation. You see, we need connection to Christ in our lives. We need a savior for our own feeble and weak minds. We need someone to help keep us on that brick road. Even when we hit a giant Pennsylvania pothole and it seems to send us off course. Have you thought lately about if you're on the path that God has sent you down? That you're on the path that keeps you paying attention? Does your path lead to the street paved with gold? Or is it just a road that goes on paved with blacktop forever? Time to act is now. The time to recenter and focus on Christ is now. No fear of condemnation. Just a realization of life eternal with our Creator. Well, friends, so how do we truly keep from being separated? We have to get our minds right. We have to set our minds on things of God. We have to set the cornerstone of our body, which is our minds. Once we have set that, we will truly experience the connectedness that we all long for. So I want to leave you with one last quote today. And that's from Dr. Hanley Moore. He was an Anglican bishop of the past generation. But um, Dr. Henley used to say, the difference between someone who is, quench, who is quenching the spirit and someone who is allowing the spirit to have free course in their life is the difference between a well in which there is a spring of water that is choked and a well in which the obstruction is removed so that the water springs up and fills the well. If we are choked by fears, resentments, indecision, self-centeredness, then we are suppressing the Holy Spirit who resides in us in order to free us.
Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this time together, Lord. Thank you for the words that you have given me to speak today, Lord. Um, as, we, as we're progressing here, Lord, over the next couple of weeks, we're talking about trying to you know, get ourselves right, Lord. Today we focus on the mind, and we know that we have to get our mind set, Lord. We have to be in that place where our mind is focused on you and not on things of this world, Lord. We need to be focused in the spirit, as Paul tells us, Lord, and just let that spirit of you reside in us each and every day. Lord, we thank you for that gift, that magnificent gift of the Holy Spirit that you have given us, Lord. And we just invite that Holy Spirit into our lives, Lord. We just ask for your continued blessings and your continued hand of coverage upon us, Lord, as we continue to move forward today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.